The committee will come to order. I would like to begin this hearing by stating the Oversight Committee mission statement. We exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have the right to know the money that the Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Let me start at the outset here. I, I appreciate you all being here. This is, uh, the, the country has invested a lot of uh, time, money, blood, uh, resources uh, to the mission in Iraq. Uh, this is an interesting day on Capitol Hill, given everything that's happened in the Supreme Court and their decisions, uh, what's happening on the floor, the contempt vote that is, uh, directly involves this committee. Uh, you will see a limited number of members participating today. It, we do believe it is vital, though, to get all of the testimony that will be shared here today. But the questions today will be probably somewhat limited with the understanding of everything that is happening in Capitol Hill. We are faced with the decision as to whether or not to delay this hearing. We were concerned that that would push us back to the latter part of July, perhaps even August. We would like to be fairly close to a quarterly type of update and hearing uh, given this. And so we do appreciate all your testimony and hope you have an, uh, an understanding of the, the complexity that is uh, this day. Um, the, the, the today's hearing is uh, entitled Assessment of the Transition from the Military to a Civilian-Led Mission in Iraq. And uh, I want to again thank you all for, for participating. We're going to focus today our efforts in Iraq since the military withdrew on December 31st, 2011. We, ass we assess the administration's progress, its pro prospects for success, and whether this strategy should be used as a model for Afghanistan in 2014. And I cannot emphasize this enough. We need to learn from the experiences that we have so that as we go through this in another situation, uh, we can make the most of it. On November 17, 2008, the Bush administration and the government of Iraq agreed to the United States would withdraw its troops by December, 20, December 31, 2011. Keeping with that agreement, the Defense Department has removed all but approximately 275 uniformed uh, personnel. The remaining troops work under the Chief of Mission Authority of the Office of Security Cooperation. State Department has greatly expanded its footprint print in Iraq. There are approximately 2,000 direct hire personnel and 14,000 support contracts, contractors, roughly a 7 to 1 ratio. This includes 7,000 private security contractors to guard our facilities and move personnel throughout Iraq. Leading up to the withdrawal, the State Department's mission seemed clear. Ambassador Patrick Kennedy testified that diplomatic mission was, quote, designed to maximize influence in key locations, and later said, state will continue the police development programs moving beyond basic policing skills to provide police forces with the capabilities to uphold the rule of law. The Office of Security Cooperation will help close gaps in Iraq security forces' capabilities through security assistance and cooperation, end quote. This is an unprecedented mission for the State Department. Nonetheless, our diplomatic corps has functioned without the protections of a typical host nation. It is also carried on without troop support that many believed it would have. As a result, the embassy spends roughly 93 percent of its budget on security alone. Without a, debt, without a doubt, this is an enormously complex and difficult mission. Six months into the transition, the Congress must assess whether the administration is accomplishing its mission. While the State Department has made progress, it appears to be facing difficult challenges in a number of areas. The Oversight Committee has offered some criticism for the, based on their testimony today, including the Government Accountability Office noting that the State and Defense Department's security capabilities are not finalized. The Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction states that, quote, thousands of projects completed by the United States and transferred to the government of Iraq will not be sustained and thus will fail to meet their intended purposes, end quote. The Fe Defense Department Inspector General's office explains that the lack of status of forces agreement has impacted land use agreements, force protection, passport visa requirements, air and ground movement, and our foreign military sales program. And the USAID Inspector General's Office testifies that, quote, according to the USAID mission, the security situation has hampered its ability to monitor programs. Mission personnel are only occasionally able to travel to the field for site visits, end quote. Embassy personnel have also told committee staff that the United States government has difficulty registering its vehicles with the Iraqi government. 
and Iraqis have stood up checkpoints along supply lines. According to one official, the embassy must des dispatch a liaison, quote, to have tea and figure out how we're going to get our trucks through, end quote. These are just some of the challenges the State Department is facing in Iraq today. Per perhaps as a result of these conditions, Mission Iraq appears to be evolving. In an effort to, to be more efficient, the State Department is evaluating its footprint, reducing personnel and identifying possible reductions. This rapid change in strategy, however, raises a number of questions. Are we on the right track? track? Are we redefining the mission? What should we expect in the coming months? And in hindsight, was this a well-managed withdrawal? The purpose of this hearing, therefore, is to gain some clarity about our efforts in Iraq. Moreover, we need to examine whether such transition is possible and how we execute in Afghanistan. Our nation's withdraw, uh, or downdraw is only two years away and will likely present a greater challenge than Iraq. We need to have answers before we commit billions in taxpayer dollars. We continue to look at these issues over the coming months, and we look forward to hearing from the testimony from the panel, as I said before. I would now like to recognize the distinguished ranking member, the gentleman uh, from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you were talking about whether or not this is a well-managed uh, withdrawal. It basically was an ill-conceived uh, adventure in the beginning and a flawed implementation for much of the time that we were there. So I think the withdrawal concept is particularly difficult to do, and we have to keep that in mind. I am going to ask unanimous consent that my prepared remarks be placed on the record so that we can sort of expedite the hearing and move forward and hear from the witnesses. Uh, so ordered. Uh, thank you. I, I really do appreciate it. Um, members may have seven days to submit opening statements for the record. We will now recognize our first panel. Ambassador Patrick Kennedy is the Under Secretary for Management at the United States Department of State. Mr. Peter Verga is the Chief of Staff of the Under Secretary for Policy at the United States Department of Defense. And the Honorable uh, Mara Rudman is the Assistant Administrator for the Middle East Bureau at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn before they testify. Please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. You may be seated. Let the record reflect that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. Um, in order to allow uh, time for discussion, please limit your verbal testimony to five minutes. Your entire written uh, record and statement will be a written statement will be part of the record. We now like to recognize Ambassador Kennedy for five minutes. Sorry. Make sure that microphone is nice and close to, to if you can. There we go. Thank you. Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Turney, distinguished uh, members, thank you for inviting me to discuss the State Department's operations in Iraq after the military to civilian led transition. U.S. forces completed their withdrawal from Iraq in December 2011, marking a significant milestone in our bilateral relationship. Our strategic goal continues to be a united, uh, unified, democratic, and stable Iraq. While security has improved overall, the situation on the ground remains challenging. Nonetheless, our diplomatic engagements are robust. Our embassy meets regularly with President Talibani, Prime Minister Maliki, Cabinet members, parliamentarians, and civil society leaders. The State Department has always planned to align our presence in Iraq with other comparable U.S. missions, but transition planning called for a robust structure that could handle multiple situations. Now that we have successfully transitioned, we are methodically streamlining our operations in a phased approach, which we call the glide path. This recognizes that security did not deteriorate when U.S. forces departed and that the government of Iraq also recognizes the value of a streamlined U.S. mission. We have been evaluating our presence and reducing personnel, sites, and agency programs under Chief of Mission Authority. We expect to reduce direct hire staffing 25 to 30 percent by the end of 2013. This is not arbitrary. Rather, we examined our operations and determined how they could be made more efficient. We have hired more Iraqis with 240 of the 400 planned direct hires now on board. We have also emphasized to our contractors the need to hire Iraqis as well. Over the next 18 months, we will consolidate onto the embassy compound and relinquish three facilities in Baghdad the Baghdad Police College Annex, OSCI Headquarters, and the Prosperity Support Annex. We will continue to make adjustments to support a robust and secure, yet appropriately sized platform. 
I would like to provide an update touching on a few key elements of our support platform. Our Iraqi planning began in late 2009 and involved an interdisciplinary team from within the department working closely with our DOD and AID colleagues. Since the follow-on negotiations to the 2008 U.S.-Iraq Security Agreement were not completed, our predicate was that we had to be self-sufficient. On October 1st of 2011, the Embassy and our consulates were fully operational and mission capable as we had long planned. While the term mission capable comes from DOD lexicon and has not been previously applied to state operations, we were fully engaged in all diplomatic, consular, and support activities, even though some of our facilities um, were not fully complete. We have continued to complete our facilities, and despite the challenging environment, we have been and will continue to carry out our diplomatic mission. Task orders for static and movement security were awarded under the Worldwide Protective Services contract for all State Department sites. The Bureau of Diplomatic Security is performing its increased oversight to ensure the professionalism of security contractor personnel. State Department requests that the DOD continue to provide life support services through 2013 under the competitively awarded log cap and via the Defense Logistics Agency. Our partnership with the Department of Defense remains highly effective. A post-transition working group meets twice a month to, to discuss life support. We are working on local sourcing of more food and fuel. We look for looking forward state plans to award a life support contract to re replace log cap by the end of 2013. Under an existing competitively awarded contract, our aviation operations support all U.S. government elements in Iraq using five dedicated fixed wing and 31 helicopters. Missions include medical evacuation, movement of security support, personnel, transportation of personnel within Iraq, and movement of personnel into and out of Iraq. We plan to downsize that program under the glide path. In conclusion, the scope of the Department's diplomatic activities in Iraq remains larger than any of our past efforts. As Secretary Clinton said during remarks at the Virginia Military Academy in April, in Iraq, we have completed the largest transition from military to civilian leadership since the Marshall Plan. Civilians are leading our lasting partnership with a free and democratic Iraq. Mr. Chairman, we are committed to assisting Iraq in securing the gains it made with U.S. assistance towards becoming a secure, stable, and self-reliant country as efficiently and effectively as possible. Thank you again for inviting me here today and for your ongoing support of the Department of State. I welcome any questions you might have. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, Ambassador Kennedy. We will now uh, recognize Mr. Uh, Peter, Verga, the Peter Verga, the Chief of Staff uh, for the Undersecretary for Policy for the U.S. Department of Defense. You are recognized for five minutes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate that, Member Tierney. Distinguished committee members, I do appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today, along with my Department of State colleagues, to provide you an update on the United States transition from a military to civilian-led presence in Iraq. Given Iraq's importance situated strategically in the Middle East, it remains profoundly in the United States national interest that Iraq emerge as a strategic partner with the United States, a sovereign, stable, self-reliant nation, and a positive force for moderation and stability in the region. In the time that since we last appeared before this committee, the United States has upheld its commitments in the 2008 U.S.-Iraq Security Agreement by withdrawing all U.S. forces by the end of December 2011. The Department of Defense has worked closely with the Department of State to help ensure a successful transition to a civilian-led presence in Iraq. Before, during, and after the transition, DOD provided all possible support to state for success as U.S. to posture state for success as U.S. forces withdrew from Iraq. Today, the Department of Defense continues to work with the Department of State to help meet its needs through assignment of DOD personnel, extensions of equipment loans, and contracting assistance. The focus is now on cementing a normalized presence in Iraq with Department of State in the lead. That means building on years of working with the Iraqis to create a lasting, long-term security relationship, including a robust foreign military sales program. Currently, our FMS program with Iraq is the fourth largest in the region and the ninth largest in the world, with a total value of approximately $11.6 billion. Of all the FMF cases with Iraq, the F-16 case stands out as the cornerstone of the long-term U.S.-Iraq strategic relationship. 
Iraq has requested the sale of 36 F-16s and associated training at a value of approximately $6 billion. To date, Iraq has deposited approximately $2.5 billion towards that sale, and deliveries of the first aircraft are scheduled in September of 2014. We are now at a point where the strategic dividends of our efforts are within reach. The DOD has worked closely with the Department of State to help ensure a successful transition to the civilian-led presence in Iraq. That successful transition enables us to concentrate on building that long-term strategic partnership based on mutual interest and mutual respect. Finally, Iraq, through its substantial FMS program, is demonstrating its desire for long-term strategic partnership and its commitment to this program is a testimony to the future of the U.S.-Iraq partnership. I thank you for your attention and look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. And we will now uh, recognize uh, the Honorable Mara Rudman, the Assistant Administrator for the Middle East Bureau at the U.S. Agency for International Development. Ms. Rudman, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Tierney. Thank you for the opportunity to discuss USAID's work in the context of the transition from a military-led to a civilian-led mission in Iraq. Our goal is a stable, self-reliant, unified Iraq. This is critical to U.S. interests in the Middle East. It is a goal made possible through enormous sacrifice by Americans and Iraqis alike. USAID is adjusting its footprint in Iraq in line with its development strategy and programmatic needs. We are focused on Iraq's sustainable development under the terms of the U.S. Iraq's Strategic Framework Agreement. Over the past 10 years, USAID's role in Iraq progressed through three distinct stages. Immediately after the invasion, USAID's emphasis was on restoring essential infrastructure and services and supporting transitional democratic processes. Then, as part of the military and civilian counterinsurgency campaign, we concentrated on stabilizing Iraqi communities and strengthening governmental institutions. Now, with the completion of the transition to civilian leadership of the U.S. effort in Iraq, USAID's focus is on helping Iraqis improve how they manage their own resources for development. Our ability to adapt and work closely with the Iraqi government and people has provided critical continuity to our work. Our current efforts ref reflect lessons learned over these years, particularly in the need for greater oversight and prioritization of sustainability. Today, USAID provides technical assistance to Iraqis to improve their abilities to finance and implement their own development projects. We are also working with Iraqis to strengthen civil society and increase civic participation, implement reforms that will encourage private sector-led economic growth, su support development of good governments and democratic institutions, support ethnic and religious minorities, and provide durable solutions for the reintegration of internally displaced persons. All of our efforts are designed with sustainability in mind, so that as an end goal, Iraqis will manage every one of these projects without U.S. assistance. In addition to the considerable human capital of the Iraqi people themselves, Iraq has great oil wealth. Revenues from the oil industry, which has yet to reach its full potential, supply nearly all of the Iraqi government's budget. Sadly, the country's institutions and ability to deliver services has been degraded by decades of war, misrule, and other factors. Rebuilding the structure, resiliency, and effectiveness of the state, the private sector, and civil society is where Iraq still needs help. Thus, our current programs are focused primarily on improving the capacity of Iraqi government institutions and consist largely of technical assistance that requires the Iraqis to match USAID contributions on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis. These efforts stand in stark contrast to the much larger relief infrastructure or stabilization projects in which we were earlier engaged. We work with the government of Iraq to first establish common objectives for new activities. We then come to an agreement with the GOI on its required matching contributions and plans for transitioning ultimate responsibility for projects to the government. Throughout implementation, we monitor and measure the GOI's progress and required cost-sharing contributions. These steps help ensure long-term Iraqi investment and commitment to the sustainability of USAID activities that specifically benefit their governing institutions. This focus on sustainability is not simply good development practice. It also reflects congressional guidance. In early 2009, the State Department and USAID, in consultation with Congress, adopted a set of policy guidelines on Iraqi government matching for U.S. assistance funds, which require financial or in-kind Iraqi government counterpart contributions for most U.S.-funded foreign assistance programs and projects that directly benefit or involve the Iraqi central government. Ensuring that the resources provided for American taxpayers are used effectively and that our contributions to Iraq's progress yield sustainable results 
requires both careful and consistent monitoring on our part and the engagement of the Iraqi government and our other partners. Thus, in addition to standard USAID protections against waste, fraud, and abuse, including checks on terrorist financing, we have designed an, an extensive and effective oversight system that is tailored for the unique operating environment in Iraq. USAID also contracts with a third party monitoring and evaluation implementer that conducts independent evaluations of all of our projects. There are multiple independent oversight bodies that also review our programs. Um, and collectively, these entities have conducted more than 300 financial and performance audits since 2003. Finally, our focus on sustainability extends to the very staffing of our effort in Iraq. In, in FY12 and beyond, we will reduce the number of Foreign Service officers at our mission, and we will hire and train more locally employed Iraqis to perform the functions that have previously been handled by third country nationals. In summary, our programs in Iraq are designed to help Iraqis use their own resources to foster self-reliance, maintain stability, and increase their well-being. Our continued commitment to Iraq demonstrates the importance we place on the mutual interests and benefits of this long-term partnership. I, too, appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today, and I am happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Rodman. I now recognize myself for uh, five minutes. Uh, Ambassador Kennedy, how many personnel, uh, contractors, and U.S. government employees does Mission Iraq currently have at its various sites? Um, Mr. Chairman, it, we have approximately 16,000 personnel at this time representing the State Department and all associated agencies, including the Department of Defense and the, uh, and the U.S. agency. Do you know how those are broken out versus government employees versus contractors? Yes, sir. It is it's approximately, uh, approximately 19,000, I'm sorry, 1,900 uh, employees, American and Iraqis, who are, who are government employees, and approximately 14,000 contractors, so relatively 2,000. To 14, and, and how does that break down? Do you have the breakdown of uh, U.S. personnel versus Iraqi nationals? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. The, uh, there are six, 1,640 plus or minus uh, American U.S. government employees, 240 Iraqi employees, and 14,000 contractors. And you don't have the breakdown of how the contractors are, are, are broken down as far as U.S. versus Iraqi? Uh, the, uh, most of the contractors are, are uh, either Americans or third country nationals. We are, in, we are increasing every day the number of uh, Iraqi contract employees as part of, our, part, of, part of our program. We have informed our contractors that in certain categories we believe and they are engaging and they are acting on our instructions, they are replacing the uh, uh, third country national contractors with Iraqi contractors. And how, how safe uh, are, op are operations in Iraq now? You know, at, at one point, you were seeing a reluctance of certainly U.S. Uh, personnel to operate outside of the green zone. What is happening now? With uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, our, uh, our personnel have been out operating outside the green zone since I was in Iraq in 2003 and 2004. We go outside the green zone every day. In the last quarter of 2011, calendar 2011, there were 3,000 missions that our out, uh, security missions that our personnel executed outside the green zone, and I believe in the first quarter of this calendar year, the number is almost up to 4,000. Uh, well, Ms. Rudman, it is my understanding that USAID uh, has hired 25 Iraqis to oversee uh, projects because USAID employees are uh, reluctant to leave the embassy because of uh, security concerns. Is that accurate? The, the 25 field monitors that were hired who are Iraqi field monitors are not overseeing the projects. They are monitoring the work, so it is an added, added staff for monitoring and evaluation work. Um, so it was augmenting our staff to be able to be out on the field on a regular basis to help with our monitoring and evaluation work. Well, so why can't our personnel uh, be out there? Is it accurate that they're, they're, they have security concerns? It is accurate that there are security concerns. The way that we would describe it would be that, that uh, the security environment in Iraq is improving. It is still not the, it is not a normal security environment in the sense of what we would have at, at embassies elsewhere. And so in terms of having the 
uh, best possible monitoring and evaluation work for our projects. It is a, seen as a good thing for our monitoring and evaluation work to have Iraqis doing that work. Um, as well, it is also part of, frankly, the sustainable development effort to teach the, to have Iraqis have that capacity to do that work so that these projects could eventually be handed over and to I, I, And I would like to ask, you know, just, just to ponder, is what needs to be done to create a level of, uh, of security and confidence for our personnel can get out there. But I am running out of time. What I did uh, also want to ask you, uh, ma'am, was the GAO has reported that Iraq has accumulated a budget surplus of over $50 billion, of which $10 billion was available for future spending. Why are we pouring uh, a lot of money into Iraq when their, their, their budget is certainly in better shape than ours? So we are actually, we have been steadily, we have been on a glide path, in fact, to reducing the amount of program money that we are putting into Iraq um, on a fairly consistent basis. That is something that we are reviewing year to year, how much money we are putting into Iraq for program assistance. In addition to that, as I described in my testimony, we have, in working out with Congress, um, been working on the, the cost-sharing arrangements with Iraq, so that since 2009, uh, we have, Iraq has contributed directly uh, on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis. Um, everything that they match funds essentially for everything that we do with them um, for government for any capacity building any assistance to the Iraqi government they match those funds and so we provide purely technical assistance to them and they match everything that we do with the idea that any development assistance they are learning how to do and will eventually take over and do on their own America has certainly invested a lot in blood and treasure in uh, in Iraq. I see my time has expired. I'll recognize the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Ambassador Kennedy. How are you? Good, thanks. I begin to think from time to time you're on this committee. I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, would you put your microphone on for us, or pull it closer, one or the other? Thanks. Um, so you have 14,000 uh, United States personnel in Iraq. That was what you said, right? For, no, no, sir. There are 16,000 16, 16, total, okay. of which 1,600 are U.S. government employees, plus another about 240, 250 Iraqi nationals who are directly employed by the U.S. Okay. government, and about 14,000 contractors, both American, Iraqi, and third country national. So what are the 14,000 contractors doing? Uh, they, do, uh, they do movement security, they do static security, they do operations and maintenance of our uh, properties all over Iraq, they do life support such as feeding our personnel, medical, aviation, and, and, a, and a small number that are involved in, in other activities. So about 14,000 people to take care of 2,000 people? That is correct, sir. What does the embassy in Egypt look like? in terms of those same types of considerations? The, uh, the, certainly the, the embassy in Egypt does not have the security concerns that, that we face in, uh, in Iraq. Of, the, of that number, approximately uh, 6,500 of that 14,000 are, are security personnel. That is a presence that we have in Iraq, it is a presence we have in Afghanistan, we have nowhere else in the world, and it is directly related to the security conditions, which are improving, but are certainly not at the point where we, where we can rely, not rely on our own inherent uh, security personnel. How many sites in Iraq are those security personnel responsible for? The, uh, they are responsible for uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. But, uh, 13 or 14, depending upon how you count one site, whether it's one or two. And, and what's the nature of those sites? Uh, there is the, uh, there is the uh, embassy, embassy uh, compound itself. There is the uh, a logistics annex across the street. There is the Office of Security Cooperation annex, which is also across the street from the embassy. There is the police training site. Uh, there is a, a support operation we have adjacent to the uh, Baghdad airport. There is our consulate uh, in Erbil and a support site at the Erbil uh, airport in the north. There is our consulate in, uh, in Basra. 
There is a joint OSCI State Department site in Kirkuk, and then there are four exclusively DOD uh, Office of Security cooperation sites in Taji, Tikrit, Umkasar, and Beshmaya, where they carry out the foreign uh, military sales uh, development that uh, my colleague referred to in his testimony, sir. Okay. What lessons, uh, this is all for all of you, what lessons are we learning in Iraq that we should take heed uh, to uh, learn from when we go into the Afghan withdrawal situation? What are the major principles? I'll start with you, Ms. Rudman. What have we learned that we ought to make sure that we are well prepared for as we start withdrawing uh, in, in Afghanistan? I would say that, that the way that we have approached uh, our work with the Government of Iraq since 2009 has been quite informative. When we look at our, our switch to the sustainable development uh, approach with the Government of Iraq so that uh, the working in partnership with them and the scope of our programs being, um, uh, being uh, ones that, that we ensure that we have their buy-in for at the front end. Um, the, the cost sharing aspect um, of it has been a very smart aspect, frankly, that you required of us and we worked with you on, um, so that when, when you literally have their buy-in, um, it's not just theoretical. They have, to, they have to pay for stuff. They have to make it work. There's much less waste involved um, at the front end. And, um, and so the scoping of the programs and the design of the programs um, makes sense for us, makes sense for them. And, and I think we've seen a real shift in our programming um, and the workability of our programming from their end and from ours since that time. I'd say that's the single most important lesson for us. Thank you. Mr. Berger? From our perspective, the most important lessons that we are learning is the, the requirement for both advanced planning and essentially a continuous cooperation and monitoring process as we move through a transitional period. Um, you can't, we can't drop any of the balls that are going on, and I think it was uh, a good lesson in interagency cooperation and uh, information sharing that uh, made this transition uh, successful. Ambassador, you got more of a broad view. It would be tougher for you to pick one. But uh, I, I think uh, my colleagues have touched on it. I would say there are three points. Plan, plan, plan. Second, a change management vi vision that, like in football, you go to the line of scrimmage and you've got a plan, and sometimes you have to call an audible, but you have to be prepared to call that audible. And so I think that we have done that. And third is just as in Iraq, we have a glide path. We anticipate that there will be problems. We scope to make sure that we are safe and secure and can carry out our mission. But depending, as we hope, on the situation beginning to continually more and be more and more stable, we have a glide path in place so that we can reduce our uh, staffing just as we are now doing in Iraq. Yeah, you, you done? I, have, I just have one more question, so we'll just do a quick second round of, uh, of questions. And uh, Ambassador Kennedy, you mentioned the, uh, the Baghdad Police uh, College Annex facility is, is one of the facilities. It's my understanding that the United States taxpayers have invested more than $100 million in improvements on that site. Uh, it was intended to house uh, the police department program, a, a multi-billion dollar effort that's currently being downsized. And as a result of the State Department's failure to secure land use rights, the entire facility is being turned over to the Iraqis at no cost. Uh, the GAO, GAO reports Mission Iraq has land use agreements or leases for only five out of, uh, out of all of the sites that it operates. Can you say with confidence that those sites now operating without leases or agreements will not be turned over to uh, Iraq for free, as was the case with the uh, police development program? And what would the cost to the U.S. taxpayers uh, be if they were to uh, lose without compensation uh, all of those uh, facilities? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, the, uh, the statement that, has been, that, that you were reading from about uh, we are closing the uh, Baghdad police development site because of a failure to, uh, to have land use rights is simply factually incorrect. We have a land use agreement for that site. Uh, as part of the, uh, the program of the police development program, there are periodic reviews that are underway 
and my colleagues who do that. It is not part of my general responsibility on the operating side of the House. Engage in, a, in reviews on a six-month basis, both internally and with the government of Iraq. It was always our plan to make adjustments to the police development program over time. But the statement that somehow that we have wasted or had everything pulled out from under us because of a lack of a land use agreement, uh, sir, is simply false. For other our other properties in Iraq, we have we have agreements for every single property we have in Iraq except for one, which is our interim facility in, uh, in Basra, which is simply a reincarnation of a former U.S. military facility there. But even in that regard, uh, we have a long-term agreement that was signed with the government of Iraq by Ambassador Negroponte in 2005 <clears throat> in which we swapped properties with the government of Iraq, and they are committed to provide us with a 10-acre facility in, uh, in uh, Basra of our mutual uh, choosing. And so we are, we are covered, sir. We will be hearing from the GAO in the, in the next panel that you know, I am basing my information on, uh, on their report, and I, I think it is an important responsibility of this committee to be watchdogs over the taxpayers' dollars. And again, as, as, as I questioned uh, Ms. Rudman about, uh, we, we had mentioned when, in that questioning, we, we spent a lot of money and a lot of blood in, in, in Iraq, and we, we just need to be careful that we are not uh, and not uh, not wasting any more money uh, than or, or spending any more money, I guess would be a more polite way to put it than is uh, than is necessary, and that we are carefully uh, guarding the assets uh, of, of the United States government. Uh, one of the uh, chief roles I think of this committee uh, is to be the uh, watchdog over the purse strings. So uh, uh, please be aware that. It, this is something we are going to continue to uh, keep an eye on in, in all of y'all's purview. And I realize, uh, as uh, Chairman Chaffetz uh, said earlier, this is a very busy legislative day. It is important that we get uh, your testimony uh, and other information in. So I will yield back the remainder of my time and, uh, and I'll offer Mr. Tierney uh, five minutes if he has any additional questions. No, I will uh, go to the next panel on that. I do want to thank the witnesses for their written testimony, their comments today, and their accessibility. I know that we can follow up on all of this. Uh, directly with them, and so in order to expedite it and move forward, uh, I'll take care and yield back. Thank you. And I too would like to thank the panel for their appearance and, co uh, and cooperation with uh, this committee and uh, it, in Congress. It's uh, it's admirable that you were here, took the time, and are staying. We uh, are committed to being open and, tra and transparent with this committee and uh, the American taxpayers. At this point, we'll take a short recess uh, to seat the uh, other panel, and uh, we will resume uh, as soon as they are seated. Uh, probably. Uh, less than 10 minutes. Uh, so uh, we stand in recess.
Committee's call back to order as we uh, end our recess and uh, prepare to recognize our second panel. Uh, first, we have Dr. Michael Quartz, uh, the Acting Director of International Affairs and Trade at the U.S. Uh, Government Accountability Office. Uh, next, we have Ambassador Harold W. Uh, Geisel. He's the Acting Inspector General at the U.S. Department of State. Um, Mr. Mickey McDermott is a Special Deputy Inspector General for Southwest Asia at the U.S. Department of Defense. Mr. Michael G. Carroll is Deputy Inspector General at the U.S. Agency for International Development. And the Honorable Stuart W. Bowen is a Special uh, Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction. Pursuant to the committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn before, uh, uh, before they testify. So, uh, gentlemen, would you please uh, rise and raise your right hands? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that the witness answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. Um, as you know, we've got a busy day on Capitol Hill today, and in uh, order to allow time for questionings uh, and, and, and discussions, I uh, would ask that you limit your testimony to five minutes. Your entire written, written statement will be made uh, part of the record, but we, would, we, we invite you to uh, summarize and hit the high points uh, of your uh, remarks. So uh, we'll start off with Mr. Kortz. You're recognized for five minutes. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, Ranking Member Tierney. I am pleased to be here this morning to discuss the transition from a predominantly U.S. military presence in Iraq to a civilian presence led by the Department of State. Uh, this work is a continuation of GAO's efforts to review the planning and execution of the drawdown of U.S. forces from Iraq and the buildup of the U.S. civilian-led presence there. A GAO was asked to testify this morning on U.S. plans for the diplomatic presence and Iraqi commitment to that presence, uh, to support capabilities for our sites and personnel in Iraq and our capabilities to provide security for those sites and personnel. The primary message of my testimony this morning is that the State Department and DOD plan for a very large civilian-led presence in Iraq, but Iraqi commitment to that presence remains unclear. Further, the support and security capabilities for the presence have not yet been finalized, and most importantly, efforts to identify security vulnerabilities and progress toward mitigating them are not being fully tracked. My first point is that State and DOD plan for a robust presence in Iraq. For fiscal year 2012, they allocated an estimated $4 billion for the presence and plan to have over 16,000 personnel at 14 different sites across the country. Uh, most of these personnel were to be contractors, primarily responsible for security and logistical support. Uh, as of last month, State and DOD were reassessing the presence and developing a plan to reduce the number of sites and personnel in Iraq. However, the mission would still comprise by far the largest overseas U.S. diplomatic presence in the world. Uh, my first point is that State, I'm sorry, my second point is that uh, the mission in Iraq has encountered delays in uh, establishing basic infrastructure and life support capabilities such as housing and water supply. Uh, construction projects are behind schedule. Uh, the Mission Iraq is uh, still revising uh, emergency evacuation plans to reflect the absence of an in-country combat force, and the Mission and its contractors have encountered delays and challenges in dealing with the Iraqi bureaucracy. My final point is that State and DOD have not yet finalized security capabilities in Iraq. As you know, Mission Iraq personnel and facilities face numerous threats, including routine rocket and mortar attacks, roadside bombs, small arms fire, and kidnapping. As of last month, the State Department had conducted security assessments of the sites that it manages and had taken a number of mitigating steps to address vulnerabilities. However, while DOD has uh, reported some efforts to address vulnerabilities of the sites that they manage, uh, they have not fully tracked those efforts. In summary, State and DOD plan for the largest diplomatic presence in the world, but a rocky commitment to that presence remains unclear. Mission Iraq support functions are still very much a work in progress. And most importantly, while operational, its security capabilities are not yet fully mission capable. And further, DOD's efforts to mitigate security vulnerabilities at its sites are not being fully tracked. And therefore, it is unclear if and to what extent U.S. personnel and facilities at these locations may be at risk. Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Tierney, this concludes my prepared remarks. I would be happy to address any questions that you may have. 
Thank you very much. Uh, we will get to the questions after we have uh, heard testimony from the entire panel. Uh, Mr. Geisel, you are recommended, uh, re you're re recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Tierney and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to discuss our assessment of the transition to a civilian-led mission in Iraq. Since 2008, the Department of State Office of Inspector General has conducted 35 investigations and 27 audits, inspections, and evaluations in Iraq. The Department has been responsive to OIG recommendations. In May 2011, OIG reported that the U.S. military was managing more than 370 civilian police and advisors. The Department has now assumed responsibility for the police development program and is consulting with Iraqi officials to evaluate security needs and downsize efforts accordingly. Pending audit reports from the Special Inspector General for Iraq Reconstruction and final funding decisions, OIG will audit the Department's oversight of related civilian assistance programs in March 2013. In response to state OIG recommendations to create an Office of Security Cooperation in Iraq sufficient to support Iraqi security forces and manage U.S.-Iraqi defense relations, DOD IG found that OSCI met full operating cap capability in October 2011. We will coordinate to monitor OSCI progress in coordination with DOD IG. In May 2011, OIG reported that the Department continued to face challenges in establishing provincial posts due to questions regarding land use agreements, staffing, construction, and life support operations. While security threats prevented construction in Mosul, consulates in Basra, Erbil, and Kirkuk opened in 2011, and continuing presence posts in Tikrit, Taji, Bismaya, and Umkazar currently serve as OSCI operation sites. OIG remains concerned about the safety of U.S. government personnel and contractors in Iraq. In May 2011, OIG reported that security risks could be mitigated through closer working relationships with the government of Iraq and its security forces. During field work for an ongoing audit of private security contractors in Baghdad, OIG found that Iraqi security forces are routinely detaining private security contractors at checkpoints and the government of Iraq is restricting airspace, jeopardizing potential evacuation routes. In April 2013, OIG will audit the effectiveness of private security contractors in Kirkuk and Mosul. The Department procured aircraft and obtained flight approval from the Government of Iraq and other foreign authorities to establish Embassy Air Iraq, currently operating routes between Amman and Baghdad, with fares of $2,400, and between Kuwait City and Baghdad for $1,600 round trip. In comparison, as of May 31, 2012, commercial round-trip fares between Amman and Baghdad were available for approximately six to $800. OIG will audit the Department's Air Wing program in August 2012 and consider the cost efficiency versus security concerns of commercial air travel. In May 2011, OIG reported that the cost to provide medical care for U.S. personnel and contractors in Iraq would be considerable. A department contractor now operates nine health units. OIG will audit the department's management of medical operations in October 2012. In May 2011, OIG reported that Embassy Baghdad lacked adequate response plans for a May casualty, mass casualty event. In January 2012, OIG reported that Embassy Baghdad and Consulates General Basra and Erbil had created emergency action plans in compliance with department guidelines and had conducted regular emergency response briefings and mandated drills. Also, in May 2011, May 2011, OIG reported that embassy facilities were near capacity due to addition and relocation of civilian staff and contractors. OIG will audit the Department's implementation of the Baghdad Master Plan in July 2012 and consider the effects of a proposed 20 to 25 percent presence downsizing. We have scheduled a full inspection of the mission early in 2013 to include further evaluation of staffing and security needs. State OIG is uniquely qualified to provide mission-specific oversight in a volatile post-transition environment. We currently have 19 open investigations related to programs and to operations in Iraq and intend to assign six additional personnel to monitor progress in Iraq. 
we remain committed to providing the Department and Congress a comprehensive spectrum of audits, inspections, and investigations on the enduring U.S. presence in Iraq. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Tierney, and members of the subcommittee, thank you once again for this opportunity, and I'm pleased to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony, sir. We will now recognize Mr. McDermott for five minutes. You are recognized. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Tierney, and distinguished members of the subcommittee. Thank you for this opportunity to appear before you today to discuss our assessment of the transition from a military to a civilian-led mission in Iraq. The Office of Security Cooperation Iraq, referred to as the OSCI, operates under the Chief of Mission Authority. OSCI is charged with managing the bilateral security cooperation and security assistance functions and maintaining a long-term strategic partnership between the U.S. Government and the Government of Iraq. In recognizing the importance of the challenges concerning OSCI and the fact that the scope of the Security Assistance Program is one of the largest in the world, we started a series of oversight efforts focused on the planning and the establishment of OSCI. In 2010, we assessed the planning effort for transitioning the Security Assistance Mission. We determined that the OSCI planning was progressing with the significant contribution made by an ad hoc cadre of strategic planners operating from within U.S. Forces Iraq. We also identified several planning shortcomings and recommended that the U.S. Central Command issue Iraq-specific country planning details, assess the procedures and resources applied to the development of the Iraq-specific security cooperation-related planning guidance, and capture lessons learned regarding the experiences of organizing the OSCI. In 2011, we assessed the establishment of OSCI and the DOD efforts to provide for its sustained, effective operation in post-2011 in Iraq. We found that the establishment of OSCI was on track, but identified some shortfalls in the planning efforts. We again determined the shortfalls were due to incomplete Iraq-specific plans. We also reported a need for planning capability within the Office of Security Cooperation. In addition, we observed a need to improve communi communications between both the OSCI and externally to the key officials in the, at the Iraq Ministries of Defense and Interior about the OSCI's enduring role regarding U.S. security cooperation and assistance programs. In response to our assessment, OSCI made improvements in the flow of information to its personnel and to when with key senior Iraqi officials. The Central Command also responded by issuing a completed Iraq country plan with necessary security cooperation and assistant details. On April 16, 2012, we issued a third report, which is classified, related to the transition on the management of private security contractors in Iraq, including private security contractors guarding the OSCI locations. While OSCI was generally successful in its transition from DOD to the Department of State, the U.S. and the Iraq governments did not finalize certain agreements that were envisioned as necessary to enable OSCI's ability to become fully functional within Iraq's dynamic post-2011 operating environment. Responding to our report dated Mar in March 20, 2012, senior OSCI officials indicated that the absence of a post-2011 security agreement or status of force agreement was affecting aspects of its operations. Some of the challenges cited by these officials including obtaining or extending land use agreements, force protection, passport and visa requirements, and air and ground movement. The precise impact of these command concerns with respect to achieving short and long-term OSCI goals is unclear. However, having a formal follow-on security and status of force agreement was perceived to have value in clarifying and stabilizing Iraqis' government support for the day-to-day -day operations of OSCI and would benefit longer-term relationship building. In closing, let me emphasize that the DODIG remains committed to providing oversight concerning OSCI and reporting on the progress and challenges of maintaining a long-term strategic partnership with the Government of Iraq. We plan to return to Iraq early next fiscal year to continue our assessment on the operations of the OSCI. Thank you again for this opportunity to discuss the work of DODIG, and I look forward to answering any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Mr. McDermott. We will now recognize Mr. Carroll for five minutes. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Tierney, distinguished members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the uh, invitation and the opportunity that uh, you've given me to brief the, the committee on the OIG, the USAID OIG's activities in Iraq uh, currently and what we see for the challenges for the future. Uh, AID was, was not part of the, the massive transition planning process, so I'll just restrict my remarks to AID's programs. Uh, as the committee might know, we, we started our oversight in Iraq in 2003 with long-term TDYs and then opened the office of seven auditors and two investigators in 2004. So we have a substantial body of work over that period of time, and if I could just give you some stats quickly. Uh, we've done over 60 performance audits during that time, conducted 153 uh, cost-incurred uh, financial audits covering $5 billion of USAID expenditures over that period of time, opened 105 investigations. Uh, 45 referrals for prosecution, 13 indictments, 10 convictions, 40 administrative actions, and 10 suspension and debarments. So we, we've, we've, we've done a substantial amount of work over time. Uh, but as uh, the, in the post-transition environment, uh, clearly AIDS funding has been coming down, as Mar Rudman mentioned, and in 2013 it's only going to be, well, I shouldn't say only, it's going to be $231 million, which is a substantial amount of money but relative to previous years, uh, it's, it's on a downward trajectory. So with state being in a complete cost recovery mode now that the State Department is gone and we're not getting uh, supplemental funding or central funding for ICAST and that sort of thing, it's become, for us, prohibitively expensive to be there. Uh, so what we're going to do is uh, maintain an office of two auditors, one investigator, transfer the other staff to Egypt, uh, because when you consider the amount of money being spent by AID in Iraq, it ranks third in the region behind Jordan and West Bank Gaza. So we will continue to provide a robust oversight package in Iraq. It just won't be to the extent that it has been in the past. And our plan for 13 would be to do three performance audits, two major uh, program reviews, one of those being a retrospective look back uh, using some of the work that uh, Mr. Bowen has done or will do on sustainability. Because we see two primary challenges for the agency uh, going forward, and, and Mara Rudman discussed them. Uh, one is monitoring and evaluation. Uh, historically, it's been problematic for AID in Iraq. Uh, uh, they've relied to a, to, to a degree on the implementers to provide performance data. We found the performance data to be suspect at times. And the ability to get out and monitor and evaluate the programs, get legitimate, accurate performance data has been problematic. So without the military, with State Department providing security, uh, we'll have to see how that goes. So we're going to be on that uh, 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 pretty substantially. The other challenge that I see, and again, Mara talked about it, was sustainability. Now, aid has transitioned from, there's been a natural progression from uh, infrastructure and reconstruction that aid was doing there for a while to more of the traditional development assistance. And like she said, technical assistance, democracy and governance, civil society, those sorts of things. So uh, on, the, on the, retrospectively, on the uh, one of our audits we just issued on uh, IT sustainability, IT systems, uh, it, it was a pretty bleak story as far as uh, the, the effectiveness of some of the programs that were implemented or not implemented but paid for. So I think the lesson learned from that, and I think the agency has gotten it, is Iraqi buy-in and to the extent that they can, based on uh, guidance from Congress, uh, get a cost-sharing cost kind of agreement because if they've got money in it, and it's in their best interest, uh, then, then it'll be sustainable. If not, then it's not going to be, based on our previous experience. So for us, the one challenge I see as we move forward, and uh, it's been a disappointment over time, has been our ability to work with the Iraqi law enforcement to get local prosecutions. And we've had some success in Pakistan, we've had success in Afghanistan, but for whatever reason, we have not had success in Iraq. We're working with our IG counterparts. We're working with the league at, uh, at the embassy to try and identify a law enforcement entity in the Iraqi government. Because as aid moves forward and implements more locally with local entities and more Iraqis involved, as, as uh, Ambassador Kennedy said, the fraud that's going to take place, if it takes place, is going to be perpetrated primarily by Iraqis. And our ability to investigate 
is, 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 is not a problem, but our, investigate, our ability to take that probable cause, find a willing partner in the Iraqi government so we can do local prosecutions, that's what we'd like to do, but so far problematic. So, so that's our one major challenge going forward. Thank you very much, and I, I, uh, I look forward to taking any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. Um, Mr. Bowen, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Tierney, members of the committee, uh, for the opportunity to appear before you and present SIGR's uh, assessment of the transition from a military to civilian-led mission in Iraq. My statement examines this question in light of five issues, uh, the police development program, the security situation, the Office of Security Cooperation in Iraq, the transfer and sustainment of reconstruction assets, and the increase in criminal investigative activity that we have seen this year. I will briefly uh, uh, summarize each of, our, uh, each of my points um, in my oral statement. The police development program was the single largest program to transition uh, from DOD management to state management over the last eight months. Interestingly, it transitioned from state management to DOD management eight years ago. Uh, the, the initial contract was, was led to the State Department, uh, but eventually challenges in Iraq and the size of the security mission required the formation of something called the Multinational Security Transition Command Iraq, which operated the police training program for in excess of six years uh, and accomplished uh, and expended a significant amount of money. The, the police development program, however, was not well planned or well uh, agreed to, or a sufficient agreement wasn't secured from the Iraqis, as our audit of last October uh, revealed. We have another uh, review coming out this July that will follow up on that audit and look at progress made with regard to those recommendations. But the most significant events that have occurred since then have, have has been the reduction in the size of the program. Uh, I think a wise reduction, a recognition that the Iraqis haven't fully bought into it and that the challenges, the security challenges that continue in Iraq have limited the capacity to execute uh, the, that, the initial ambitious range of the program. Second point, security situation we saw today again, uh, bombs across Baghdad killing 15, um, punctuating what has been a, a very uh, violent June. Uh, the, the year began violently in January. March uh, was, saw the, the least violent month since, since 2003. So it's, it's a very volatile situation. That's what, tell, that's what these stats tell you in Iraq. Notwithstanding whatever those numbers are, the, the requirements for personnel to move about the country are the same that, as they were essentially in 2006-2007. So it's, it's expensive, and that's why the largest single expense uh, in Iraq right now uh, for the embassy is security. Uh, as Ambassador Kennedy pointed out, in excess of 6,000 uh, co contractors are security contractors, and, and most of the money is going to pay their salaries. Uh, the Office of Security co Cooperation in Iraq uh, is spending about a billion and a half dollars in Iraq Security Forces Fund, the money the Congress appropriated for training and equipping the Iraqi Army and the Iraqi police. We issued an audit in April about uh, the progress they are making in using the, that money uh, in the uh, FMS program. It raised some concerns about the obligation rate, but my meetings with General Kaslan, who runs the program, uh, assuaged our concerns. We will have a follow-up report in July uh, that gives concrete points on the progress made regarding the use of that money. A continuing issue that SIGR has addressed over the years is the transfer and sustainment of projects that we spent $51 billion producing. And, and it is not a, a good story. The, the, the audits reveal that that uh, there was no consensus upon how to transfer these, these projects. Our audit program did stimulate the development of a sustainment program and sustainment requirements in contracts, um, but it was for the most part too little too late. And, and frankly, Iraqis have not bought into investing significant sums into what we provided, in part because they're not sure what we provided. That's what I hear it over and over again from Iraqis, and, and that's understandable given the weaknesses in the database. Uh, that we developed. Indeed, our audits of the Iraq Reconstruction Management System found that it captures maybe 70 percent of what we provided. That's certainly unacceptable. 
Lastly, uh, we've seen an uptick in, in uh, criminal investigative activity uh, simply because uh, as, as the program has drawn down, for, one, for, for whatever reason, people have been uh, more uh, willing to come forward and provide us with leads. And second, some of our technical uh, uh, examinations of what happened to that money have produced um, more cases. So we have in excess of 100 investigations going on. We just convicted our 71st person this week, uh, and, and our SIGR prosecution initiative continues to, to produce good fruit. So with that, I'll conclude my statement and look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. I'll now recognize myself for uh, five minutes. Uh, Mr. Kortz, uh, Ambassador Kennedy and I got into a discussion about the absence uh, or presence of land use uh, agreements for the facilities we have in, in Iraq. Do you, have the, do you have the current status of that or at least the information from your latest report as to uh, what facilities we do and do not have land use agreements for? Yes. Uh, what Ambassador Kennedy may have been referring to is that for 13 of the 14 facilities, uh, the Iraqis have acknowledged uh, a presence through diplomatic notes, but there are still only five of the 14 for which we actually have explicit title land use agreements or leases. All right, so I'm not a I'm not a diplomat. I, so what does that mean? They they say, all right, you can use it till we change our minds. Is that basically what those are? Or is, it, or is there some force of law to those uh, notes? Well, I, the notes are definitely not the same thing as having an explicit agreement. Uh, and if, as a matter of fact, there's already been one case uh, where the Iraqis required us to uh, reconfigure, downsize. Um, one of our sites, and that was uh, one of the sites where we did not have a land use agreement. And so obviously we are in a much more vulnerable position when there is not an explicit right. agreement. All right. Mr. Cow Mr. Carroll, I would also like to follow up a question I had on the, uh, on the last panel about the uh, use of uh, Iraqi nationals in, uh, in over overseeing some of our investigations. I mean, does that, I mean, what is your opinion on that? Does that strike you as a good idea, a bad idea, or something we are stuck with because there is uh, no alternative. It seems like a, you know, a, Americans would be a little bit more concerned about how their tax dollars were spent uh, than the uh, uh, Iraqi nationals who are the recipients of those tax dollars. It is kind of a fox guarding the hen house, it looks like. <laughs> well, I, I, I personally, I, I think it is a, like, like Ms. Rudman said, it is an, it's an additive uh, s sort of a step. We, we would do the same thing. For example, uh, in some of the places where, where it is absolutely prohibited because of security, what we will do is contract with a local uh, CPA firm, primarily out of Egypt, and do a very comprehensive agreed upon procedures document that they will go out and they will take pictures, they will ask questions. They would do what we would do if we could get there. So I think that's what Mara is talking about as well. I don't see it as a problem. In fact, I see it as an, an adjunct to, and it's not a replacement for USAID uh, contracting uh, representatives and technical rep representatives actually getting out and ensuring that the work is being done. That's not what these people are doing. What these people are doing is going out, just doing some monitoring and evaluation, but it does not replace what the responsibilities are for the Americans. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm not sure if I want to address this to Mr. Quartz or Mr. Uh, uh, Bowen. Whichever one of y'all seems most eager to answer can uh, <laughs> can take this. You know, I, I haven't been to Iraq. My uh, you know, information in the field uh, of what it's like on the ground there is based on things that I've read and uh, reports that I've seen on uh, on television. But uh, a good many of our facilities uh, are in metropolitan areas, including the the capital Baghdad. And you know, I, I'm concerned about that we are struggling getting food and water to uh, to, to these folks in in a safe manner. Uh, I mean, what is the procedure? I mean, is the food delivered? How, 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 is that, how is that handled and why is it a problem in, in a metropolitan area? I mean, there, there are you know, hundreds of thousands of people in these cities, Iraqi nationals, uh, that need to be fed. I mean, obviously, it is more complicated than just doing, going down to the Safeway. But, I mean, how is that handled and why is it such a problem? Uh, the, the State Department, as Ambassador Kennedy indicated, continued the log cap contract uh, after the military withdrew in December. And thus, the process for 
bringing food into the country continued as well, and that is via convoys that come up from Kuwait. Uh, there have been challenges that 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 checkpoint has occasionally been closed. There have been security challenges uh, with regard to those convoys, uh, and other reasons that 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 the shipments have been intermittent and has led to an occasional shortage uh, of certain foodstuffs at the embassies. Uh, Ambassador Jeffrey emphasized repeatedly uh, this spring his desire to move towards local purchase, but that's been slow. All right, and then we were, there's also a lot of concern about the amount of security that's necessary and how much we are spending on it. Could you take a moment, just a, a typical day in the life of a, a of, a, of an embassy employee, I mean, uh, where do they do they do they sleep on the compound? Do we have security at where they're living? Uh, do, do we escort them home? I mean, does it? It looks like the ratio of contractors to employees is almost seven to one. Uh, I don't right. know. I don't know how many of those are security personnel. I mean, is it is it like the president, where everybody has a security detail that travels with them uh, everywhere they go? How much do yes. they get out, and how, how does that work? It, it's, as I said in my statement, uh, very much the process that existed in 2007. So the, the drop in the number of attacks has not led to a relaxation in the security requirements. And those security requirements are dictated by the regional security officer at the embassy. Uh, in, in Baghdad, the situation, as a general matter, has improved greatly. But, but still, to make a movement uh, outside the embassy grounds requires 48 hours of Notice uh, three hardened vehicles multi and a couple shooters in each each vehicle and and a limited time on site uh, uh, for to carry out your mission. So it, it is a restrictive environment from a security perspective. By the way, it's it's still quite dangerous up at Kirkuk. You know, while there haven't been very many uh, duck and covers as as we say at the embassy this year, uh, that's not the case up up at the Kirkuk facility. Uh, Basra is similarly is has a much more uh, difficult security situation than than those who operate in Baghdad. And do our personnel live on the near on they, the side? They or live they? at at the embassy in Baghdad. Yes. Okay. So we're, we're not we're not sending you know dozens of people home with somebody. I no. Mean. Okay. Um, I, I see my time is like uh, way expired. Uh, I guess we'll recognize the uh, gentleman from uh, Massachusetts, and we'll, we'll give him six minutes as well. You are very kind. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, uh, like it or not, I have been to Iraq, uh, I think, 13 or 14 times now. And uh, <clears throat> a couple of things in the testimony uh, raised some concerns for me. Uh, Mr. Carroll, on USAID, I understand the security situation there. It's very, very difficult. But uh, <clears throat> it seems to me that it's, it's probably the worst situation we could have where our inspectors can't get out to the sites to review the projects that the American taxpayer is paying for. Uh, that's just a very tough and that's a tough situation. I'm very uncomfortable with that. I know I, I've been out uh, many times with uh, Mr. Bowen and his, uh, his inspectors uh, on site in Iraq. Uh, <clears throat> there's a certain value in having U.S. personnel go out there engineers, if, if possible, to review some of these uh, projects. Uh, we've had widespread corruption at various levels in Iraq, so there's been a, you know, experience there that, that uh, should cause us to be uh, very, very cautious about where our money is going and whether these projects are being uh, built to proper standards, number one, and whether they're being built at all. Uh, and whether some of our money is being uh, diverted. Uh, is there any hope here? Uh, is there any way that we could uh, enhance the cooperation that we're getting from the Iraqi government by, by withholding funds for these projects unless we get access to those sites and have the ability to do proper oversight? Right. Well, I, it, it's not the Iraqi government that's I don't want to say creating the problem, but but that's it's not the Iraqi government. It's the RSO, as as Mr. Bowen said. Uh, we during the transition period, which was a very difficult period, I think we we'll all agree with that. Uh, we, we were turned down on three of our seven movement requests. But but again, that that was a very difficult time. Since then, we've been able to 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 make site visits, and and like Mr. Bowen said, it take and you've been there too. It takes a lot of planning. 
so you can't just drop in, which sometimes we like to do, particularly on the investigative side. Uh, the, the way it's going now, everybody knows we're coming, and, and, and so that creates some problems for us. But so far, we have been able to do our work. Now, as aid has moved from what's not their traditional kind of work, and that is reconstruction, when they were doing that quite a bit in the early days, and now it, it's, it's a lot of technical assistance, and it's a lot of the meat and potatoes of like I said, democracy and governance and civil society and education and health and those sorts of things, most of that is located in and around Baghdad. So it's not as if we have to go to Basra or Kirkuk or something like that. So we're confident that if we're smart about it and we work with the RSO, that we can do our job. Like, like I said earlier, it's extraordinarily expensive for us to be there, so we're going to change our sort of footprint a little bit. But, but I, I want to assure you that we're still going to provide substantial oversight of the aid programs. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Stuart, if I ask you, uh, in terms of the deployment of our, we've got 6,000 uh, private contractors there. Is this, are these all uh, DynCor? Are they U.S. nationals? Are, I mean, What's the makeup of that that security force? They're not all dine courts. It's under the worldwide protective services contract that the state department manages. Uh, Triple Canopy is there, okay, yeah, uh, and uh, and others. The the uh, the guards themselves uh, are are third country nationals, as, okay. I've, as I've observed. Okay, uh, but uh, and then there are. Variety of other companies that are that are working there. I should say the static guards are third country nationals. Those that are that are running the uh, the convoys themselves that are that are doing the driving or the shooters in the in the suburbans are are uh, Americans contractors. Okay, uh, what's the security? I, I know we've got uh, several sites there, and uh, you mentioned the difficulty in Kirkuk. Uh, yes. Give me, give me the worst situations uh, that we have there right now for our facilities uh, that Mr. McCourt, Mr. Court was talking about as well. Um, what's, what's the worst situation we got? Is it, is it Basra? Is it? Uh, uh, it well, Mr. Unch, I think it's a, it's a close call between Basra and Kirkuk, but Kirkuk is subject to indirect fire quite regularly. And that's, that's are, we, are we still getting rocket uh, attacks in, in, out of Sadr City into, into Baghdad? Uh, very, very infrequently, uh, and 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 the uh, the duck and covers have are, have been minimal at the embassy in Baghdad. N con contrary wise in Kirkuk, it's it's a weekly, if not daily, experience. Mm. What about in Kasa down at the port? There are they are we having bad situation down there as well? In in Basra, the the size of the. Uh, Consul down there is limited, and their their capacity to move about is limited, and and because of that, the the police development program office that was going to operate there has been uh, withdrawn. Now, is that our decision, or was that the Iraqi decision? Our decision, but 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 the Iraqis. And when when I was uh, in Iraq at the end of April and met with uh, Minister Acting Minister Asadi. Uh, he said that he needed maybe 15 or 20 advisors, in his view, from the program. Uh, the program, as you know, started out at about 200, dropped down to 115, now down to about 70 to 80. It'll, the plans are to bring it down to 30 to 40, um, and, and then it will continue to evolve and devolve, as it, as it were. Yeah. Mr. Corr, can I, can I switch to you for a second? Uh, where do you see the, the flash points in terms of our facilities? Is it uh, you, you had a whole list of sites that you had identified in your testimony. Uh, what, what are the bottom three? What are the most? What do you worry about at night in terms of your facilities there, Congressman? Uh, the State Department and the DoD uh, agreed together that they would meet uh, three overarching criteria. Uh, in the area of security to be considered fully mission capable. Uh, the three criteria that they identified were that they, they would have secure and protected facilities, that they would have the ability to achieve the secure movement of their people, and that they would have emergency response capability in place. They, they didn't meet those criteria in October, and in many cases they still don't uh, meet them today. I can't go into the details of what the exact vulnerabilities are because that's sensitive information. However, I can say that they intended to have certain security features in place 
at sites in October. Uh, some of those features are still not in place today. Uh, some of them are not slated to be in place until sometime in 2013. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the State Department intended to have the use of MRAPs uh, to help achieve the secure movement of their people, the mine-resistant ambush-protected vehicles. Uh, the DOD provided, I think, something close to 60 of those vehicles, but our understanding is uh, that the Iraqi government will not allow their use, and so they're essentially uh, sitting unused right now. Okay. Well, that's important for the, for the committee to, to, to know. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm trying to get you to tell me about site-specific uh, concerns that you have. Uh, are, there, are there some uh, areas that you think uh, desperately need uh, security attention right now? Uh, again, I can't get specific about the oh, sites. Okay. Uh, right. However, All right. I say I'll, let, I'll, let, I'll let you go on that. Okay. Thank, we can talk <laughs> later. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, sir. Uh, we'll now recognize the other gentleman from Massachusetts for five minutes. Thank you. Texas, get the sense we're ganging up on you? <laughs> nah. <laughs> uh, which, if any of you uh, gentlemen, has been looking into the planned work being done on the embassy the, that was reported by Walter Pincus in the Post this morning? Mr. Geisel, uh, what kind of work are you doing in terms of evaluating the expense there and the, the purpose? Well, uh, we started actually, uh, oh, I guess it was about more than three years ago, uh, with an audit of, of the building of the embassy it, uh, it, itself. And as you, you know, we recommended to the department that they uh, recover, I believe it was over $200 million uh, from the uh, contractor for what was really slipshod uh, and worse than slipshod uh, construction. Uh, th this uh, did they recover? Not to my knowledge. Uh, it, it would probably take court action, and uh, we, in all candor, uh, we understand that it's it, asking for the money is one thing, and finally getting it after battles is another. But we we really believe the department should be trying to get it back. Uh, we on a continuing basis uh, audit uh, the department and construction. Now, for instance, let's take the $100 million uh, that uh, was mentioned in the article. I don't know if that's an absolutely accurate uh, figure, but what I do know is the department does have plans. What we will be looking for, uh, first of all, you have to remember the department doesn't have that money yet. It's, it's asking the Congress for the money. But where we come in uh, is we will we want to know what is the department going to get for that money? Are they going to are they have pro, do they have provable savings of two hundred million dollars, or is it a matter of security? Uh, that's what. Uh, or is it a matter of something nice to have? Uh, and we'll be looking at that, but we can't look too far until and unless the Congress decides to give them that money that he spoke about. Yeah, well, I would hope Congress would find those answers to those questions before giving the money, frankly. I mean, it's a $700 billion biz, uh, building, uh, million dollar facility, rather, before we get started. $700 million, slipshod work, incredible expenditure. We went all through those hearings under Henry Waxman and, and others on that. And, and it's now they want to spend 60 to $80 million, supposedly, over the next two years for a central utility power plant, underground fuel storage facility, wide fire water distribution, domestic water system, sanitary sewer system, storm water system, and telecommunication system. So can you tell us whether or not $700 million just didn't address any of those issues in a compound of that size? I think the answer is that obviously uh, the, the, the way the $700 million was spent didn't. And, and that, that, that was in our report. And the question now is, are you throwing in good money after bad, or is this something that, that is going to save us money? Has anybody uh, looked at evaluating their proposed purpose for using this facility, the number of people who are ostensibly going to occupy it, and how that may be different than in other embassies of similar mm -hmm. size and purpose? Uh, that is really going to be done under our Baghdad uh, master plan audit, which uh, begins literally in a matter of days. And what we're going to do is review whether the infrastructure that is already in place and the proposed new construction 
align with the short-term and long-term uh, diplomatic presence. Uh, so I, the answer is we're looking and we'll let you know. I mean, obviously that should be conditioned on that. We also look at uh, part of what they're proposing is a classified embassy annex uh, extension. Uh, seems just considerable work, maybe 20 to 35 million dollars on that. Are you going to be able to? It looks to me that they're talking about a sniff and some other things on that basis, some classified stuff. Are you going to be able to see what you need to see to make an evaluation of that, or oh, should this committee and others in Congress be looking to make sure it's evaluated by some other appropriate entity? We have all the uh, all the clearances we need to look okay. at that work, and we certainly will. Okay. I mean, it's it just having sat through the hearings on, on the original embassy construction and failures and. Or whatever, it's something that we definitely have to do. And I also question, you know, 700 million, another seventh of that, 100 uh, million plus for things that look like they were a bit intricate to any building of that nature out there. How they could have left them out uh, is sort of uh, surprising on that. I'm also very interested that we take a look at how many people they plan to have in that facility and what their purposes are and how that purpose aligns to what the diplomatic mission is. Are we doing diplomacy out of that building? Are we doing something else? Do we need those people for that particular mission? Um, you know, where does it line up? One mention in this article is they're going to consolidate other things. So are we taking a presence out of other parts of the country and putting them in there only to find out that later mobility and security improves and you're going to be kicking them back out? All those questions are yours, hopefully, to give us some advice and, and direction on. I'd love to have you lead the team. <laughs> I think you're asking the very questions we, we, we will be asking. Well, I'm comforted to know that you're going to ask them, because I think all of us up here uh, just sit there with our mouths gaping open when we look at the amount of money for such basic things on that, and we look at the staggering number of people that they're going to put in an embassy that I've not seen in any of the embassies anywhere else, in comparably sized countries. I understand the security issue, uh, but if a country doesn't want our people to be moving around, we have to take a look at what, how we limit our presence there uh, and just work with that. Uh, this, this idea of having private security people running around getting paid what they're getting paid to then tell us that they just can't move their security advice to stay put, you know, is, is kind of crazy on that. So thank you for your help with that. I, I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I'd like to thank our witnesses for taking time to uh, be with us. Uh, as I think the testimony today has uh, made clear, this is an ongoing issue. So I suspect we will be seeing many, if not all of you, uh, in front of this committee again. And again, I thank you for your uh, participation. The committee stands adjourned. Wow. Very good.